Hey everybody, it's Goblin X, and welcome back to some more Magic Arena, and today is the launch of Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth on Arena, so I'm going to be playing my very first sealed event of the format. So without further ado, let's see what cards we get to play with today. Starting off with our rares in the sealed pool, they look pretty weak overall. I don't think Goldberry is a particularly good card in sealed or draft, neither is Fangorn Tree Shepherd. Just a big slow dirtly creature and kind of a slow dirtly ability. Elven Chorus is not a card I'm a very big fan of in draft or sealed either. You really want to have like 20 creatures in your deck for this to be super worth it because otherwise a four man investment to not affect the board in any way is kind of a hard sell unless you can draw a lot of cards off this and if like 20 cards in your deck are creatures then that means 50% of the time you'll get an extra draw off of the Elven Chorus for your turn because 50% of your cards are creatures that could be on top of your deck. So you could spend four mana, draw one card next turn, and then nothing the turn after that, and maybe draw one or two the turn after that. That's pretty worth it, but a lot of decks at like 15 or less creatures, I don't think Elven Chorus is super worth it, unless your deck is already really slow and grindy. So don't love Elven Chorus. And then I also don't love Rivendell. It's fine if you are in blue as a nice little scry engine to set up your draws, but not really a reason to head into the color. That being said, we've got two solid rares here. Orcish Bowmasters, I think, is the strongest rare in the sealed pool. Two mana for a 1-1 one -one you can cast at instant speed with the flash ability. You get to do one damage to any target when it hits the board to clear out a little 1-1 one -one from your opponent. Maybe stack up some extra damage to finish off a larger creature. And you get to amass Orcs 1 at instant speed, which is really nice. That gives you another 1-1 one -one out of nowhere if you didn't have an Orc army. Or it buffs your Orc army up with a plus one plus one counter if you already had one. So either of those abilities is pretty nice and pretty flexible to have at instant speed. Not only that, if your opponent plays any card draw, the Bowmasters is going to keep pinging some stuff and making your Orc armies larger. So huge fan of Bowmasters, best card in the sealed pool most likely. But we've also got Fall of Gilglad, which is a solid 2-drop green Saga. It's a bit slow, as all Sagas are, but getting 2 Power Toughness out of it for 2 mana with those 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters, and getting a Fight Spell out of it that might even draw you some cards if you trade your creature off, it's pretty nice. It's even got some Scry to be that kind of icing on the cake, so I think these two rares are pretty sweet. We'll keep those in mind as we build our decks. But I don't think we really need to consider the other four as reasons to be in any particular color. Let's check out our colorless and multicolored cards now. I'd like to check out the colorless cards to see what kind of mana fixing I have available in whatever deck I build. And we've got fine mana fixing, Shire Terrace, Shire Scarecrow, and Inherited Envelope if we see anything that's really worth splashing. I don't think any of our rares were really worth splashing though because our best rares were both two mana cards and part of the power level of two mana cards is how early in the game you can play them. If you're playing that, uh, that Saga or that Bowmasters, on turn 7 instead of turn 2, it is going to be a significantly weaker card, so I don't think we're really interested in splashing based on our rares, but there could be some sweet uncommons, particularly the multicolored ones that we might be interested in splashing. The only one that looks really splashable here is Gandalf's Sanction, a super powerful win condition and removal spell stacked into one for any deck that has a really high instant sorcery count. This is a super fun card to draft around, super powerful one to draft around because you can make sure to pick up tons of instants and sorceries throughout the draft. In sealed, you're at the mercy of what you've opened, whether or not this card's going to be good. But it's a really nice headliner for the blue-red spells deck. Ring Sight is not really a card I would recommend playing in draft or sealed at all. It is a tutor effect, which means for three mana you get to search for basically any card in your deck, put it into your hand, and then shuffle. Um, the problem with these kind of Tutor effects in Limited is they really just end up being like 3 mana draw a card, because the vast majority of the time, the best card in your deck is not significantly better than the worst card in your deck, um, unless you're playing a really balmy format like March of the Machine. The Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth is definitely not that balmy, so not a big fan of Ring Sight. Uh, and then Shadow Summoning is quite strong, if white and black are pretty powerful colors. This is a really good card to run out on turn 2, because then you're going to get chip damage in on your opponent throughout the game. Tons of little flying damage coming through with those two 1-1 flyers. So, really like the Sanction and the Shadow Summoning. We'll keep those in mind for sure. Powerful reasons to consider 
white, black, and blue, red. Start taking a look at all of our individual colors now. We'll start off with white, where we have some very filler creatures like Nimble Hobbit, Eastmark Cavalier, Took Reaper, and Stalwarts of Ozgoliath. These are all fine cards, but none of them are impressive. Errand Rider of Gondor, however, is a great creature. There are a ton of legendary cards in the format, and if you have a Ring Bearer on the board, which you get by having the Ring tempt you, then you will have a legendary creature on board, so it's not that hard to turn Errand Rider into a 3-mana three 3-2 three that draws you a card, and even when it doesn't straight up draw you a card, it still draws one and puts one back, which is still a solid ability for a 3-mana creature, so big fan of Errand Rider of Gondor, but the rest of these creatures aren't that exciting, and neither are, are the uh, spells, to be honest. We've got a Dane Blade, which is okay. Fog on the Barrow Downs is okay. It's one of the weakest removal spells in the format, as is You Cannot Pass. These are both just really situational. Fog on the Barrow Downs doesn't stop whatever you're enchanting from using its abilities, so it's not good against most of the legendaries in the set that sit on the board and have a good ability that affects the rest of the game. It's also not great against... Um, like orc armies and stuff because it does make their army lose its other creature types so they do get to make a new orc army every time they amass now and uh, they don't really lose all that much from losing their first army just not a very impressive card and you cannot pass is really really situational sure it's not hard to have a legendary on board but a removal spell that can only kill blocking or blocked creatures is still pretty bad even if it didn't care about legendaries because you're never going to be able to kill like a good evasive threat if you have a flyer just chipping in and you don't have flyers of your own this is never going to clear that out of the way if your opponent has a ring bearer that you're having trouble blocking because of its ability to make it uh, so it can't be blocked by creatures with greater power you're still going to keep getting shredded by that ring bearer because you can't blow it up with this so uh, it's just not the greatest. You also don't blow up anything that has a good ability that's just sitting there and not attacking or blocking. So, not a huge fan of our creatures, not a huge fan of our non-creatures. I think white looks pretty mediocre overall, and I'm not that interested in the color. Moving on to blue now, looks like we have some excellent non-creatures. The creatures are still pretty mediocre here. Knights of Dol Amroth is really slow, but it can get big. Navigator's only good if you have a ton of cards that want you to scry. Same with Nimmerdell Watcher. Goldberry really doesn't do very much. And Ayorath of the Healing House. It's just a fine kind of mana to work, basically. I do like our non-creatures here, though. The Bath Song's a really good draw, just card draw spell, that can also make sure you don't mill yourself out with that shuffle ability. And the shuffle ability is really nice to be able to just pack your deck with a bunch of powerful spells, because you just cast a bunch of instants and sorceries throughout the game, and then shuffle them all back in so that your ratio of lands to non-lands is so much more in your favor than your opponents because you've just stacked another you know four to eight non-land spells back into your deck so i like the bath song a good amount lorian revealed is another great card draw spell as is arwen's gift uh there's a couple hithlane knots deceive the messenger for nice little combat tricky sort of things these are a lot of the instant sorceries just non-creature spells in general that i'm looking for when i'm drafting the blue red archetype especially the double trees in a visengard because this can put your gandalf sanction back on top of your deck to draw it again next turn to use as a finisher so if we have really good red cards to go with the blue red archetype we've got some solid blue cards for the blue red archetype i don't think these are great for any other blue decks though like i don't think this is a great start for a blue black deck a blue white deck anything like that but certainly we've got the spells for blue red so we'll keep that in mind as we move on to black now all right i can already tell i'm a big fan of black i think this is probably our strongest color by a lot so far We've got that Orcish Bowmasters, of course, but we've also got an Easterling Vanguard for another cheap card that can trade off in a mass. We've also got four two-drops because we have March from the Black Gate and Mordor Muster as more two-mana ways to amass an Orc army. So these also count as two-mana creatures, which is excellent. And we've got a good amass theme going on in general with all these cards. We've also got Gothmog, Morgul Lieutenant for another amass card that also makes all of our tokens have Death Touch. Super sweet with that orc army, no matter how big it is. It's going to stay relevant during combat with Death Touch. We've got two excellent removal spells with Claim the Precious and Bitter Downfall. And that's not it. We've got a one-mana instant speed removal spell that's quite good. We've got another removal spell with Lash of the Balrog that can make the cut. 
some decent graveyard recursion and combat tricks. I think our black in general quite a bit better than our other colors. The only weakness that it doesn't have like big finishers, I guess. I was going to say the creature count's kind of low, but we have March from the Black Gate and Mordor Muster, so it's more like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight creatures, which is basically as much as you'd want for half your deck. You want 15 to 17 creatures that could get us to 16 if our other color has like eight creatures as well. So yeah, we are quite likely to be playing black. Moving on to red now, we've got some mediocre combat tricks with Rush the Room. Solid one drops with the Lancers. I'm not a huge fan of Fire Leaper or Battle Scarred Goblin, but they're fine two drops. War Beast is a fine five drop. Yeah, our non-creature spells are just not the greatest. Double Quarrel Zen, Double Breaking of the Fellowship is kind of narrow removal because you need your opponent to have two like big, like equally sized creatures on board for it to be great. You want your opponent to have like two 5-5s five on board so you can kill a 5-5 five five with this. Um, if your opponent is in a position where they have like a 5-5 five five orc army and then a bunch of 1-1s, one this is just really bad because all it can do is blow up a 1-1. One one. So pretty situational, pretty narrow. It still makes the cut, but it's not exciting or a reason to really want to play red. And I think the same is true for these combat tricks, the improvised club. Pretty much red in general is kind of all filler. It varies from bad filler to good filler, but there's nothing but filler in our red. And last but not least, hopefully, we're going to move on to our green now, which does have that Fall of Gilgalad, which is cool. It's got Fangorn, but Fangorn doesn't do much. A 7 mana 410 is fine, but 7 mana is just so much of a mana investment. You really want your creature to have some kind of strong enter the battlefield effect, or you want some kind of evasion with trample or something like that. 410 Vigilance that basically doesn't say anything else on the card is just not where it's at, especially when it costs triple green, so it's really color restrictive too. So I don't think we're playing Fangorn. I don't think we're playing Elven Chorus unless our creature count is monumentally high, but Quick Beam's a great finisher. Enraged Horn is a huge tree folk as well with Trample. Celeborn the Wise is fine. Doondane Rangers is fine. We've got good late game green creatures. We had those four two mana black creatures, so maybe black green is where it's at here. I don't think any of our other colors looked... I mean, like, green looked fine. Like, maybe a little bit above mediocre, but, like... White, blue, and red all kind of looked mediocre, so... I mean, I can... Thanks to Magic Arena's deck builder, I can really easily look at all the two color pairs slapped together and see if anything looks super spicy. Uh, but I just don't think we have really spicy cards in any color except for black. And to an extent, we've got some solid green stuff. Yeah, I mean, the curve in black-white looks good, but we do end up running some pretty filler creatures and non-creatures, just cards in general. Black-blue. We have a lot of non-synergistic cards in black-blue. We've got a lot of blue spells, though. This puts us to 49 cards, so we could cut a lot. But, I mean, it's kind of just our good black spells and then a bunch of card draw in blue, which I don't think really makes a particularly functional deck. Yeah, it's just a bunch of the scry nonsense out of the blue. One Knights of Dolamroth. I like our, our blue card draw spells and stuff, but I just don't think we have enough power in blue-black. There's just nothing like finishing the deck. The blue just makes it more consistent. There's no like finishers is what I mean to say. Black-red does not look terrible. Like we get a couple two or five mana five fours, two mana five fours. If we had two mana five fours, we would just immediately be playing black-red, but got some five mana five fours that does give us some finishers we got quarrels ends to get some consistent card draw in here overall though the rest of our red cards pretty unexciting i think you know black red really doesn't look bad black red and black green i think are the two options black green our mana curve is definitely going to be worse but i think we just get access to some stronger cards in this color pair so i think i'm going to do it and I don't think any of our off-color cards were strong enough to really want to splash in. So I think I'm just going to go black-green. And that'll be it. So let's cut the scry theme. 
because we're not going to have a lot of scry out of just green cards. And my apologies for the deck builder just completely lagging out on me. I don't know what happened, but with the Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth update, the deck builder runs like garbage on my PC. Everything else still functions just fine, so... It's a really weird issue. That's just one of those things about PC gaming in general. It's like, I can go run Cyberpunk in 4K, but... Heaven forbid I try to edit a deck in Magic Arena. Um... Yeah, cut more of this, the scry kind of stuff. I think we cut down to one Celeborn. With the scry ability. Because I don't really have anything else working with him, so he's just going to be a standalone attacker. Definitely cut out the Fangorn and the Elven Chorus. Kind of have to run some filler non-creature spells here, though, if I cut all that. One, two... Two of our non-creature spells amass an army, so we're at like 14 creatures, which is not horrible. Definitely a low enough creature count that the uh, the Elven Chorus would be really bad in this deck. I like Revive the Shire, Sam's Desperate Escape for late game. That's a little redundant having both of those. I think that's the only thing I don't like here. I think all of our creatures are quite solid. They're quite fine. I'm just not a fan of having both Revive the Shire and Sam's Desperate Rescue. I feel like we probably want to cut Revive the Shire. Yeah, any permanent I'm bringing back from my graveyard is just going to be a creature outside of the Fall of Gilgalad. So... I think Sam's Desperate Rescue is better, but I don't think this is an 18 land deck, and I don't think we had any colorless cards that were really good, nor were there any uh, green or black cards that are better than a Revive the Shire. I guess I could just play the second Celeborn. I could play a Chance Met Elves. I really don't have Scry going on, though. Could play the Galadream Guide. What is the Scry count in the deck right now? Four? Yeah, I mean, it's really not exciting. What are the colorless cards again? Oh, we could play around with a Mirror of Galadriel. It's a pretty slow card, but so is the Revive the Shire. I think this probably plays better than Revive the Shire. We don't want any of his mana fixing, though. Yeah, I'll play a Mirror of Galadriel over Revive the Shire. Sealed tends to be a slower format. You can dirtle around with some card draw like that. That actually makes the deck look pretty nice, I think. Because we have some Tempt the Ring going on. So we have just straight up... I guess we can't search for Legendaries that way. Let me just search right there. Okay, so we just straight up have one, two, three... Three legendary creatures right off the bat. And one, two, three, four, five ways to have the ring tempt us. So what, that's like eight? Eight ways to have a legend on board? So Mirror of Galadriel should be like four mana most of the time. Sometimes it could drop down to three or even two mana. If we're super lucky. I think on average, late game, we can get this down to costing 3 mana, because we can have one natural legend on board and then one ring bearer on the board. We can never have two ring bearers on the board, though, so even if I draw multiple cards where the ring tempts us, it's not going to reduce the mirror's cost by more than one. So yeah, I mean, 3 or 4 mana to scry one draw card is not bad. It's definitely a late game mana sink. It's definitely not something we're doing early, but... Same goes for the card we cut for it, so I think Mirror of Galadriel's fine here, and I think I'll call it a deck there. I mean, I'll double-check our, our colors here, but it does look like quite a bit more black than green, so 9 Swamp, 8 Forest makes sense to me, especially because we do want double black on turn 3, ideally. We don't need double green till turn 6. One last check. Yeah, 15 black cards, 7 green. I don't think I want to cut lower on green with a really nice double green finisher and with some green 1 and 2 drops. But I definitely want more black than green, so 9-8 split seems reasonable. I think I will call it a deck there. Alright, here's a look at our final deck for our first sealed event of the Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth. Not a super exciting sealed pool, not a super exciting deck, but we've got a pretty average, pretty reasonable deck today. Nice little green-black mid-range pile of cards here. We've got a pretty good curve. We have three one-drop creatures to get on the board. 
The Haunt of the Dead Marshes are just expendable blockers that we can reanimate later in the game. Mirkwood Spider is a nice death toucher to trade into anything. And then we have Easterling Vanguard, Orcish Bowmasters, Woe's Pathfinder, March from the Black Gate, and Mordor Muster for two mana creatures. So good quantity of one two mana creatures. Nothing at three mana. That's where the curve falls apart a little bit. But overall, a good amount of one and two mana things to do so that we are getting started early in the game. And plenty of four mana and up things to try to close things out. Dane Rangers for ring bearer value. Celeborn the Wise for some scry, as well as just being a really big attacker over time. Snarling Warg quite often gets to be a 4-4 menace because we can create an orc army pretty frequently. Gothmog's really good amassing that orc army. And then we just got some big tree folk to end things. A 5-mana 4-5 trample. 6-mana 5-6 that also buffs two creatures when it hits the board, giving them both plus 2 plus 2 trample to the end of turn. So nice big later game creatures. Nice, cheap, early game creatures at the start. And in between all of that, we've got some good, flexible, non-creature spells. A couple removal spells with Bitter Downfall and Claim the Precious. Golem's Bite and Lash the Balrog as well. And a little bit of Graveyard Recursion with Sam's Desperate Rescue. Combat Trick with Shelob's Ambush. A little bit of Card Draw with Nasty End. Just a little bit of everything. A nice, flexible, mid-rangey deck for our green-black sealed event today. Without further ado, let's head into the gameplay, see how it does. Here we are on the play for game one. Super solid hand. Like the Mortar Muster into the Fall of Gilgalad. Orcish Bowmasters later to clear out a one toughness blocker. I actually don't know what the right way to play with Bowmasters is in general in this format. Is there enough card draw you should just always slam it down on turn two? To keep them from drawing more. I'm not sure. For now, I'm going to just play it when I see a one toughness card to blow up generally. I feel like that's fine value. But as the format progresses, I might get a little more um, interested in using it differently. This is interesting. So Fire Leaper is going to deal damage to something when it dies equal to its power. So if I bow masters it, they can kill the bow masters. Might still be fine. I mean, I amass one, so my orc army becomes a 2-2. Two, two. Could just drop Fall of Gilgalad this turn, Scry 2. I could even play Bowmasters in, like, the upkeep next turn. I don't think that'd be best. Because then I just, like, shoot the Fire Leaper. They shoot it before this ability resolves, giving me the counters anyway. Yeah, Fire Leaper makes things a little awkward. I guess I just attack and offer the trade. It's not like I'm going to have a beautiful block for it. You know what? Actually, I could have a beautiful block for it. Well, no, because they can dump mana into it. Never mind. This isn't going to play how I wanted it to. Oh, no attacks. Well, then it's fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to bite the bullet here. They can kill my Bowmasters. They pick one of these and they kill it. No matter what, I'll have I'll have a 1-1 one, one Bowmasters or I'll have a 2-2 two, two army. It's up to them. Um, but yeah, my my thinking there was like, if they just went for an attack without holding mana up, I could Bowmasters and just block with the Bowmasters, which is cute. And they can't kill the army because the army's going to be a 2-2. Two, two. I just shoot them in the face for one. But they were never going to do that. Even if they had something to cast this turn, they would do it post-combat and hold the two mana up so they could... If I didn't ping the Fire Leaper and they did attack in, they could just block and buff the Fire Leaper and shoot the army. Oh, I didn't know it orders like that. Okay. It's actually still fine with me, because if they have any card draw, we still get to trigger the Bowmasters again. Alright, interesting stuff. This is my first sealed event of the entire format, so I am definitely still learning. I've done some early access drafts, but... Interactions with rares like Orcish Bowmasters are not things I am very well versed in right now. Well, we've just drawn into an incredible curve here. We've got our enraged tree folk thing that I have no idea how to pronounce. It's going to let the ring tempt us, get an unblockable Bowmasters, I guess. Um, and then we just quick beam next turn and just slam them for so much damage. I am not going to block here. I don't want my tree folk to die to a combat trick when it can pressure them for so much damage next turn. 
They have the three mana pacifism here. Maybe some kind of removal. They're definitely looking over our board state, figuring out what to do. Ooh, that's a really good one. Kill my 4-4 four, four and my 1-1. One, one. So if I quick beam here, I just hit for 6, but then I have a 5-6 on board, so I think it's still worth it. But that does make the quick beam trigger significantly less powerful. Oh, you know what's going to be really nice with quick beam at some point? If you have a relatively big ring bearer on the board, like a 3 power ring bearer or something, there's going to be some weird combat where it's best to buff two of your opponents like 1-1s one or something. Or two of your opponents like 2-2s two or something to make them 4-4s four so that they can't block your 3 power ring bearer. That's so cool that they let it uh, target your opponent's cards. Alright, let's scry 2. Don't want either of those. If they've got a removal spell for our tree folk, they're going to win. If they don't, they're probably going to lose. It is all up to that. Let's see. Do they have a removal spell left? Or does the final tree folk make it there? Because it's going to be a six power trampler. And their crusher cannot block right now. If they draw a goblin or an orc, they could also be okay. Not a lot of orcs in the set, but there are a lot of ways to amass an orc army. So if they draw a goblin or if they draw an amass card. Then they can uh, they can be on blocks next turn. Which won't mean that we immediately lose, because Mirror of Galadriel can put in a lot of work. If they have a removal spell here, we basically immediately lose, because they hit us for like half our life total this turn, then finish us off next turn. So we're going to send four damage at us with the Crusher, which means they probably don't have a way to make it uh, able to block. Let's put a couple counters on the Tree Folk. Let's uh, scry one and draw a card here before I get into combat. I think I have more black combat tricks than green ones, so we'll hold up that. Mana. I also have the double black removal spell, so... March from the Black Gate? That's a pretty good card. It's not like gonna immediately make sure I definitely lethal here, but it gives me another creature, which is good. So I'm gonna keep that. Yeah, if they chump block, they just get trampled over. They gotta have some kind of combat trick. All right, no combat trick. The trample from the tree folk is going to finish things off for us, and we're going to start off 1-0. and oh. uh, Don't have anything massive to say about that game. I'm still really unsure about how the early game went. I don't know if I should have just played the Fall of Gilgalad earlier or the Bowmasters. Uh, definitely Bowmasters versus the Goblin Pinger was a little, a little awkward. Don't know how that should have played out. Uh, in the best way for us. Don't know what we should have done there, but late game, I think everything was pretty solid. We did well there, so 1-0, heading into game two. All right, here we are for game two. This is a pretty slow hand, but it's got a great removal spell. It's got mana ramp to speed it up a little bit, but when we draw a couple more lands, we could have some issues. I'm still going to keep it, though. Both colors, good removal, good late game mana sync. Not a horrific start. Draw into a Gothmog. That's going to be a great turn three play. Play our Pathfinder turn two, play our Gothmog turn three. And our opponent's going to do the same, get their own Pathfinder down on turn two. They are on the play, though, so they are really going to be ramping out here. Yep, Dundane Rangers, so that they can have the ring tempt them whenever they play a land. That is super good. I think it's probably even worth killing that here. I have Claim the Precious, Golem's Bite, and Bitter Downfall. I think it might be worth Claim the Precious that and Bite the Mana Dork here. Slow them down. Because if we can make this game grind out, we can use the Mirror of Gladriel to draw twice as many cards as our opponent in the late game. So let's just interact with their early game plays, clear that stuff out of the way, and then start using the mirror. 
Chance Met Elves, just a 3-2. Could hold up the plus one plus two combat trick or attack for one. Not that concerned about getting this one extra damage in. I'm going to hold up the plus one plus two death touch combat trick in case they try to play a fight spell or something. We can kind of counter their removal spell with this. If they play like the Stew the Conies, where one of their creatures deals damage equal to its power to an opposing creature, we can make our Morgul Lieutenant have five toughness, and then it won't die anymore to the three damage that the elves would give. We've got two legends out, so the uh, mirror is going to cost three a turn, which means we can play the mirror and have the mana up to use it next turn. Not really getting aggressive here, but that's fine. Mirror of Galadriel is going to make sure that even if we don't get aggressive, we are slowly but surely grinding out a long game victory. As long as I don't mill myself. But that's going to be pretty hard to do. We have 28 cards left right now. Grey Haven's Navigator. So that's going to buff up the Chance Met Elves. They're going to be a 4-3 now. Gothmog's pretty great against that. We're always going to have a 1-1 Death Touch no matter how big the Elves get. Unless they kill Gothmog. And it's Fury, and this is why we keep the Ambush. So, because its power is 4 or greater, it gets a plus 1 plus 1 counter. It's going to be a 5 power creature. Then it gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. It's going to be a 6 power creature. And it's going to be 5 toughness. It's going to be a 6 5. So, I can still kill it because of Death Touch, but I'm going to lose my Lieutenant either way. Is it worth trading the ambush off i think it is kill this thing with a combat trick instead of a full-on removal spell but then i don't get to mirror of galadriel this turn and i don't get to block it super well yeah i'll go for the ambush they'll trade and then i can use my two mana to eat the food i don't think i have anything in my deck that uh, can sacrifice the food for value just double checking our deck list. Yeah, we only have ways to sacrifice creatures, so I can absolutely just eat this food with my extra two mana. Have a nice little snack. Okay. So it's uh it's four mana to use the mirror now, which is a little bit of an issue. Yeah, I kinda have to play a four-four to block the navigator. Kind of worried about Pathfinder. If they get to seven mana, they can start using it as a buff spell. Yeah, I'll just play the Warg. No Mirror of Galadriel this turn. They're down to two cards in hand. Generous Ent is one of them, so I'm very happy to still have a bitter downfall because we're going to need to kill that. I can play Fall of Gilgalad and still have the bitter downfall. Scry out of those, pick up an Easterling Vanguard because it's cheap enough to play and scry one draw card next turn. Send in the Warg. Because if they double block it, I kill both their creatures. If they don't block it, I deal four, then I take three on the crack back from the Navigator, which is fine. Could play around the hexproof trick by killing Generous Ent before I pass the turn. That might have been worth it. Definitely not pre combat, but during our end step there, before they untapped their lands and drew another card. Alright, they've got one card in their hand. Let's try the bitter downfall. Alright, their one card in hand is not the Hexproof trick. So we are down to 20, they are down to 14. Treason of Isengard, they're going to put an Ents Fury back on top of their deck. To fight off our Pathfinder or something? I'm just going to make a really big menace Snarling Warg, I think. So I get to play Easterling Vanguard, I get to scry one draw card off of Pathfinder and three lands. Did 
They're down to eight now. We're still at 20. We get our little fight spell on turn three of the Fall of Gilgalad. All right, they're going to go ahead and eat their food, so they're at 11. They're probably going to end Fury our Pathfinder because it gives us another mana and it gives us a legendary on board to make the mirror cheaper to activate. And they don't have any big enough creatures to fight the Snarling Warg anyway. It's one of the few creatures they could fight and not lose a creature. Well, I guess all of our creatures except for Snarling Warg they could fight without losing a creature. But there's only three creatures they could do that with, so... Technically, it is still one of the few. All right, they're going to pass turn. Let's use our mirror. I will definitely draw Celeborn the Wise. And we hit a land as well. I don't think Ents Fury's instant speed. It is not. Do they have the seven mana? One, two, three, four, five, six. They do not have the mana to activate their Pathfinder, so I can warg whatever I want. Which I guess is just the three, two. I could also have fought the Easterling Vanguard into the two, two and drawn the two cards. That could have been interesting. Uh, so if I play Celeborn, I've got two... Yeah, I've got two Legends on board again. Which means it's three mana to use the Mirror of Galadriel, which I can definitely use it. Uh, yeah, these trades are both fine. Should have just held off on Celeborn until post-combat. Doesn't really do anything pre-combat here, but that's okay. Guess it lets me scry one, draw one in the middle of combat if I want to, off of Mirror of Galadriel. No blocks. They're going to go down to three life as we pass the turn. Rangers of Athelion. When it enters the battlefield, gain control of up to one target creature with lesser power, as long as you control Rangers of Athelion. So they have to choose the Pathfinder or the Vanguard here, basically, because if they choose Celeborn, I can make it four power in response, and then they won't get to steal it. And they are going to choose the Vanguard, fair enough. That is a tapped creature, but they could fight with the Ents Fury and have the Vanguard die off. I guess they can't because both our creatures are 1-1s one and Ents Fury gives the Vanguard plus one plus one when it fights. So it won't die and give them an army or anything here. Yeah, I don't think... If I just draw land, they cannot survive because we can just use Pathfinder to give plus three plus three trample to somebody. Celeborn or the Snarling Warg, whichever one would trample over for lethal. So we just use Mirror of Galadriel looking for a land this time, and then next turn, we, uh, I guess these trade. Interesting. Uh, ooh, March of the Black Gate's actually kind of sweet. Yeah, I'll, I'll draw that, even though a land is probably lethal. Yeah, those are going to trade... And then they're just going to scoop, which is fair enough, because we we still have the Snarling Warg on board, so we're actually just already lethal. Because they have to double block the Warg, which means that four damage gets in, even without the Pathfinder ability. All right. Cool. That was some really nice stuff from the Snarling Warg and the Saga there. We just made a really beefy Menace creature and got a bunch of damage in with it. We are now 2-0 and as we head into game three. Here we are now for game three with a really nice curve. If our opponent has cheap removal, all they got to do is kill our Nightmare Elf. And then uh, the fall of Gilgalad will be significantly worse. I'll keep this land for now. If I see even more lands afterwards, I can scry them away with this. But I do want to make it up to five mana with this hand. All right. If they don't kill the Nightmare Elf, then Fall of Gilgalad's going to be great. If they do, it's going to be pretty bad. I actually probably should have kept the land underneath the Rangers there. All right, they don't kill the Elf. Let's go. Turned it into a 3-3. I mean, if they 
They know that chapter 3 is coming, so we're not going to get a fight spell out of it. But Scry 2, get 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters. Not bad. Saga did a little bit of work. What is that? Gain control of an artifact? Tap 2 creatures, put a stun counter on each of them. Then draw a card for each tapped creature and opponent controls. That is really good. Well, I mean, I wanna, I wanna play creatures. They're gonna draw two cards off of it if I play another creature. But if I don't play another creature, I'm not impacting the board in any way, which is super, super bad. Go for maximum ring tempting, or do I make sure I have an untapped creature next turn? Because they tap two of them down. Let's make sure I have an untapped creature, I think. So they lock down Gothmog and the Haunt of the Dead Marshes, probably. Next turn we can enrage and have the Ring tempt our Orc army. Or we could play the Rangers and have the Ring tempt our Orc army. These aren't significantly different on this board state. Yeah, and I've got two lands coming, so if I play Rangers and then the Orc army dies, we get another Tempt the turn after that. I mean, I guess because I have another land, I can also just play this Tempt this turn, and then next turn play Rangers and Tempt that turn too if it dies, so either way. I guess the only way to know that we Tempt two turns in a row is Rangers into the Tree Folk. So... I don't know if that's worth it though, because Trample's pretty big. Yeah, Trample's pretty big on this board. I'm just going to play the Big Tree Folk. I'm not going to attack. I'd deal one more damage to them, but I'd let them draw a third card, which is not valuable to me. I will let them gain one life to not draw a third card. All right, so the Rangers only have the Ring Tempt us if we don't control our Ring Bearer, so we want to play those post-combat after they might trade something off into our Ring Bearer. Currently they can't, though, because our Ring Bearer is too small for them to block. They need a one-power creature or a zero-power creature on board to block the Orc army. It is an army of one right now. Legolas. Alright, they still can't block the orc army. What does this even do? When they scry, they get to untap it. Once each turn. Ooh, Sam's Desperate Rescue means I think we just flunge, and if anything good dies, we put it back in our hand. Whenever one of our creatures dies, they get a plus one plus one counter on Legolas. That's kind of threatening. Alright, but we send in the squad. We've got a Desperate Rescue. And I can afford to recast anything but the big tree folk without playing this land, which is very nice. Alright, so they're going to block and kill Gothmog, which means we get to recast that, which is beautiful. Keep it on the orc army, I think. And Legolas is too big to block the orc army still. There's a Mirkwood Spider, so they've got a nice little Death Toucher that can easily trade into the Orc army. So there goes that. And then Legolas blocks our Trampler. They still take six if that is how they block, which is dead. So they need some more creatures of removal. Ooh, Breaking the Fellowship is a really good when we have a Death Toucher on the board, actually. Yikes. Okay. Okay. And Legolas is a very big deal for all of our non-orc army creatures. This is like the full stabilize. Oh my god, yeah. That's super bad. Super, super bad.
That's the full stabilize. I think our opponent is in the lead now. Obviously, I'm in the life total lead by a lot, but I have no cards in hand after the Rangers, and they've got four that we don't know of that are all non-land, which means they can easily recover here. All right, well, Haunt of the Dead Marshes can come back from the grave, so I think we make that the ring bearer. And then the, their only choice for how to block it is with the spider. We get to draw a discard. Find a Lash of the Balrog. That is very good, but... Unfortunately, I can't afford it right now. So now we can kill Legolas, which is huge. I guess there was a little bit of an argument for actually... Uh, I'm going to put a stop on my upkeep so I could reanimate this during my upkeep and scry into a land if I want to try to make one of these the ring bearer because then if it ever hits my opponent they lose three. So if they just have one really big blocker and they're tapped out then I think I need to try to scry into a land and have one of these uh, like this gets through unblockable and then deal an extra three with the ring bearer mechanic. So yeah. Plus... If I scry pre-combat, I can still just Lash of the Balrog, because I can sack the Haunt of the Dead Marshes to the Lash, instead of just paying the full 5 mana. So I might as well get the scry 1. Alright, yeah, that seems reasonable. Definitely want the upkeep stop so we can scry before we draw a card. Really just hoping that our opponent's hand is like a bunch of creatures and they just slam down a blocker or two here so we don't have to worry about any instant speed interaction. Peregrine took 3 mana 2 3 and a Legolas is a 1 4. So my creatures are all too big to actually get in with the ring bearer mechanic. If you cast a spell that targets it, put a plus one plus one counter on it. When you cast a spell that targets a creature you control, it deals damage equal to its power to something else. That's spooky. And Peregrine just makes extra food. Okay. So if I lash one of these and attack with both, I can put them to like one life. Because I force them to trump Gothmog by making that the ring bearer and then have Dune Dane deal four, putting them to one. Yeah, we try to fight a land off of this. That is not a land. The 1-1 one, one death touch isn't horrible here. I don't need the ring bearer immediately. Like it would still be fine to kill this Legolas. And then send both of these in, and then they get to block the 4-4, go to 2. Yeah, this is still good. I don't need the Ring Bearer to have a great attack here. And this gives me a really good block for their Legolas. Well, their Legolas that I'm not about to kill. The green-blue one. Kill this one, that way they have to chump block and lose a creature. If I kill the other one... Then they could just block the, the three power creature and keep that on board. So they're down to two and here's our death toucher to block their Legolas. Put a stop on our upkeep again. There's a many partings which gives them another food token to gain three more life. They don't find a one power creature as a blocker. An unblockable Mirkwood Spider for four damage off of the Ring Tempt could be really good. Oh my god, what a draw. Fear Fire Foes. At least they can't afford to attack if they don't have another creature. They do attack, so they must have another creature. But Fear Fire Foes clear out two of our creatures there. 
Oh, gain the three. I guess I don't get the Haunt of the Dead Marshes back. Now I don't have a legend. Okay, so literally any land means I win the game. Oh my god, that might be the only card in the whole deck that's a bad draw right now. Any creature would be fine too. Yeah, Quick Beam would win the game. Celeborn would be great. Yeah, all of our creatures, all our removal spells. This is literally our only bad draw in the whole deck. Tons of our draws were lethal. Right, we got that 1 out of 25 to crush our soul, and now they're going to top deck removal and kill me in one turn, most likely. Even if they don't kill me in one turn, I have to chump at this point. <sighs> Today is not a day to go at the lottery, because uh, that 1 out of 25 absolutely demolished us there. All 24 other cards in our deck would be significantly better. And a majority of them would kill our opponent immediately. Ten of them are lands. There's a combat trick, combat trick that would immediately kill. Removal spells that would all basically immediately win as well. I do not think we could have drawn a worse card. Um, I don't think there's a point in doing this before we draw naturally. Vanguard's not bad. Except that I'm one mana off from playing Vanguard and using the mirror. Yeah, mirror is really, really bad this game. Good grief. Yeah. I mean, what can you say there? I don't think there's a lot we could have done gameplay-wise. We just top decked horribly. It is what it is. But it is a massive bummer. Yeah, if we drew Vanguard one turn earlier, that would have been two chump blocks in a row. Cool, fine lethal this turn. Doesn't matter, we don't have any outs there. At that point. But yeah, Easterling Vanguard one turn sooner would have, been, would have meant that we hit them for four. Put them to one life and have two chumps for Legolas. Force them to chump with Peregrine Took on the next turn and yeah, go from there really well. And obviously any land combat trick or removal spell would have been insta-win. Bummer, bummer draws to end that game. Two and one heading into game four. Snap keep for game four, starting with our turn one Haunt of the Dead Marshes. Getting some of our nice beef late in the game like the Snarling Warg and the Enraged tree folk. Keep this land here. We're trying to make it up to five mana with some pretty strong cards. East Mark Cavalier. 2 2 Vigilance destroys goblins and orcs that it deals damage to. So if we get a really big orc army, it'll still just trade into the Cavalier. Now a Took Reaper, 2-1 that tempts the ring when it dies. Well, has the ring tempt them when it dies. Bowmasters is a really nice card, but I think I need to be mana efficient here and drop one of my 4 mana plays. I'm going to go for the Warg, because it blocks super well here, and uh, sets up as a really good attacker once I have an Orc army on the board. But it's already a fine attacker. Oath of the Grey Host. That's a very strong card. It's pretty slow, but it's very strong where basically the first mode doesn't really do anything. We get equal value, but then we lose three life, they get a treasure, and they get three 1-1 one -one flyers on mode three. That's the really scary one. Uh, so I think I'm going to try to kill a 1-1 one -one flyer with my Bowmasters, most likely. So for now, let's have the ring tempt us, get an unblockable haunt of the dead marshes. They could double block the warg if they want, but we start getting some damage in here, which is real nice. Cool, they are down to 15. This turn I have the mana up to play Gothmog, and then also flash in a Bowmasters during their turn after they make their flyers. 
Black Breath is moderately annoying. They just kill our haunt. That's fine. Just a one for one. Especially since it's with a card, we can just keep reanimating anyway. Took Reaper. Ooh, Quick Beam. Tempted to just do that. That is a lot of pressure on their life total. Yeah, let's just jam it. Huge swing this turn. Take it all, go down to four life. They do have a food to gain three. Be at seven here. Cavalier gets in since it's the ring bearer. We're down to 11. They play a Snarling Warg as another blocker. So I think we play Gothmog pre-combat? No, Gothmog doesn't affect combat at all. I guess it makes Warg slightly bigger, but I think I'm in a Bowmaster's mid-combat. Either way, which still makes the Warg bigger. When is there any way I'm going to do anything other than Gothmog post-combat anyway? Like, am I going to eat a food? Am I going to play a Haunt of the Dead Marshes? Highly doubt it. Let's pre-combat it here. Just get the Snarling Warg buff guaranteed, even if they don't block in a way that makes me want to use Bowmasters. So that if it gets through, it's immediate lethal. I guess maybe, I don't know, Surprise Bowmasters is probably better. Because then they might just let the Warg through, but... I guess... No, they're at 7. So it's not immediately lethal either way. I don't know. This way we get one extra damage out of Warg if it gets through. Or if it gets, like, blocked by a 4 toughness thing. Um, without having to play Bowmasters, so I could still instant speed a Bowmasters during their turn if it's better. Doesn't look like it's going to be better. It looks like I'm going to be shooting a Took Reaper here so that my enraged tree folk kills their warg and stays on the board. Yep. That seems pretty good to me. I don't trample over anymore, but clear out a lot of their board. They're at three life facing a ton of creatures, and they don't have a food token left. Need to put that stop on my upkeep so I can scry before I draw a card. I think everything left in my deck is less than uh, less than six mana for sure. I think I have some five mana cards, but mostly four mana or less where I'll have the mana up after. Scrying with Haunt of the Dead Marshes. Alright, they're just going to scoop them up anyway. So we are now three and one, I believe. So no matter what, we're going to get a 50-50 run with this deck, which is pretty nice. I don't think this sealed pool is the strongest ever, so... If we get at least 50-50 or better, I'm happy, and we're guaranteed 50-50 or better, so... See if we can't keep it rolling, get as many wins as we can, get as close to that 2,000 gems as possible... Because that is the entry fee of these sealed events. So you need to get 2,000 gems to break even, which is pretty hard to do in sealed. It is a relatively big factor in why I prefer draft over sealed on arena. Three and one, heading into game five. Here we are for game number five. We've got another curve where we are hoping they don't have cheap removal for the Haunt of the Dead Marshes. Because if so, they are going to negate so much of the fall of Gilgalad, but... Got both our colors. We've got good setup. We're going to go for it. Quick Beam? I am keeping Quick Beam. That thing is such a finisher. No removal? Alright, no instant speed interaction yet. Please, no sorcery speed removal on this haunt. I like both of these cards so much. They're really strong cards, but we need to make it up to 6 mana now. I'll keep the march and not the other tree folk, I think, because that gives me something to do next turn. 
right now I don't have anything to do with my mana turn three. Yeah, that, I think that's reasonable. I'm so sad to pass this up because this tree folk's been playing so well for us, though. I could just get greedy, but I shouldn't. I'm gonna get. Uh, I'm gonna get greedy. I keep the tree folk. We're at four out of five lands for the tree folk. We just need the card right under it to be another land. It's super simple. It'll definitely play out perfectly. The card right underneath the tree folk is a land. I promise. Well, our opponent just has nothing right now. Uh, I'm going to put it on the haunt because I feel like that's the most likely one for them to spend a removal spell on right now, but I don't think either is going to die this turn, so I really don't think it matters. I should have played Gothmog pre combat. That would have been one extra point of damage. I guess this way, if they did have a removal spell, I could reanimate, so it's not like pointless to hold on to Gothmog there, but I do think it was better to get one more damage than to play around a removal spell. Doesn't matter, our opponent does not cast a single spell all game, so I think they were on a mulligan, so maybe they just had a land heavy hand and just did not have like any castable spells at that point, so... Pretty quick, pretty easy victory there. Not much of a game, but we are going to be 4-1 and one now. Going to be leaving with more wins than losses in this event. See if we can keep it up heading into game 6. This is a pretty slow hand, and we need a second black source. This is really close to a mulligan because the only thing that we know we can do is play our rangers on turn 4, and playing nothing till turn 4 on the draw? Super, super bad. Plus, we need a second Swamp to even play Claim the Precious. Like, I could absolutely get lucky and draw some 1, 2, 3 mana plays, and everything can go fine, but... Sand's got some definite issues here. We are on the draw. Gives us more opportunities to draw into spells. We have both of our colors, just not enough of one color. It's a coin flippy hand for me. Go for the mulligan here. All right, this is a better hand for sure. Get rid of one of these lands because we can scry three really quickly. So we know we can scry into more if we need them. All right, there's another land. I don't actually really need that right now. And I'm going to scry two soon enough. So I'm going to ditch that. Mordor muster. The one one orc. All right, we drew a <laughs> five drop, so now I do want to scry pretty badly. I think I want to scry badly enough to not play the Pathfinder here. All right, these are not lands. Definitely get rid of Claim the Precious. I could see keeping the Bowmasters. That still feels kind of greedy, though. No way we keep the Claim the Precious. Westfold Rider, that can blow up our Saga, I guess. But they are not going to blow up the Saga, fair enough. Drop the Pathfinder, we can play the Tree Folk next turn if I draw another land. Could Lash of the Balrog here, but I'd have to sack something, and I don't really want to sack either of these right now. Gonna let us try to do the fight. So if our Haunt of the Dead Marshes dies to some combat trick, we get to draw two. I actually really want to draw two here to hit my next land, so I think I'm even just gonna offer the straight up trade for the 3-1. And like even if they kill it before this or something, we well, I guess if they kill it before this, we don't draw the two. But if they use a combat trick to save their creature, then we'll still draw two. So fingers crossed, we want our Haunt of the Dead Marshes to die after this ability resolves. I don't care that much whether or not the Westfold Rider dies. Okay. 
It's a trade. And we will draw two, find a land, question mark, maybe. We do find a land. Beautiful stuff. Get that big tree folk down. Make a ring bearer out of our mana dork, I guess. Our opponent has dropped their fifth mana onto the board. The Battle of Bywater. Destroy our tree folk, get a food. All right. One for one removal spell, fair enough. Ooh, Gorbag's really good with a 1 1 army. Cards are really absurd if you can keep amassing one. That can be very bad for us. So I'm tempted to try to blow that up. I could scry one and then lash the Balrog, sacking the Haunt of the Dead Marshes, since kind of the same as just. Spending five mana on this. I could also Sam's Desperate Rescue, but I'd like to do that once I draw one more land, then I can Desperate Rescue immediately play the Tree Folk. Could play. I guess I could play Celeborn and I could Desperate Rescue the Tree Folk back in the same turn. Yeah, I guess we don't have to kill Gorbag immediately. I'm going to put the Ring Bearer onto Celeborn, because we're already going to want to attack with Celeborn every turn to scry one. And with the Ring Bearer, we'll also be drawing a card, discarding a card every turn. There's an Aowyn, Lady of Rohan. And another removal spell, Lost the Legend on Celeborn. Big bummer. All right, Vigilance to Gorbag. Focus for two. And that is it. Okay, now I can tap out for the Enraged Thingy Maduki without tapping Pathfinder, which means I can attack with Pathfinder, draw a card, discard a card. Is it worth it, or do I want to lash the Balrog, the Eowyn? Not really. None of these abilities matter against a 4-5 right now, so we can go for the Tree Folk for the turn. Draw a card, discard a card. Find a March from the Black Gate. That's a really good one. I think I get rid of Nasty End then over the Easterling Vanguard. Those are the two that I could get rid of, basically. Feels better to get rid of Nasty End. Leave as many creatures as possible to play around with. Tale of Tenuvial. Make one of their cards indestructible, then they're going to reanimate something from Grave, which... Just a 3-1. Yeah, this is not that bad for us. They get a 3-1 back next turn, and then give some creatures lifelink. Super fine. Rangers is a good draw, if we ever lose a Ring Bearer. And keep attacking with Pathfinder. If I can tempt the ring one more time, then I'm at level 4 and I do a bunch of damage. Can't really do that, though. I guess I could march from the Black Gate or Easterling Vanguard and uh, haunt to the Dead Marshes at instant speed, since I don't really want to blow up any of these right now. And I don't really tempt the ring with... I don't have the ring tempt me with the Rangers, either. Yeah, just play a 2-drop and pick up a Haunt, I think, is the line. I'm going to go for the Vanguard. Because I'm not going to be attacking into the 2-4 with my army anytime super soon. You know what, I forgot I was going to draw a card, discard a card, and I kind of want Celeborn. I guess I'm just discarding Celeborn now. Maybe I should have uh, kept Vanguard, played March, and discarded the Vanguard. I like that these cards are going to stack up over time, but I like Vanguard's immediate impact more. But I think I probably should have got rid of Vanguard. Yeah, I guess I'm getting rid of the March then, at this point. Four, 
fumbled that a little bit. Forgot about the draw discard of the ring. Would have been better to... March for the Black Gate is better over the long run, right? So Easterling Vanguard would have been a better discard. Easterling Vanguard just has a better immediate impact on this game, which is why I wanted to run it out first. But by running it out, it means I don't have that option for my discard. And I think that's the weakest in the long game, but the best in the current position. So I should have just discarded the Vanguard. All right, there's a Lash for our big tree folk. So that is gone. Vigilance on the Aowen here. Focus with her. We'll take two. Get her haunt back and scry one. Land is fine. It's not great, but it's fine because we've got the rangers later. They don't get to have the ring tempt us while we have a ring bearer, though, so land's not, like, super valuable. Yeah, I don't think it currently matters much. We'll put that on the bottom. All right, hit another land. I'm going to keep this in hand for the draw discard. I'll remember this time. Is this an elf? It's a human shaman. Okay, so we can't attack with an... Well, I could attack with the Haunt of the Dead Marshes, but that'd be a chump attack. But it would let me scry one, which would buff Celeborn, which is kind of cool, but... All in all, probably not worth it. Yeah, especially when this can block the 3-1 on defenses, which is great. Okay, so we can draw a card, discard a card here, and then play Celeborn post-combat. Mordor muster is not horrible. All right, two of their creatures get lifelink. Their indestructible is finally gone. So on board, they don't have any great attacks. Go for Vigilance. They're going to go for it. Some kind of combat trick here. It probably doesn't affect both of these combats, and we've got enough follow-up. Doesn't matter too much if we get blown out here. Yeah, this is going to affect one of their combats. We'll still kill both of their creatures. This is perfectly fine. Yeah, this is reasonable. We're in the lead still. We got three extra cards. They got one. Board state's tied up. And a 4-4 body might just be impactful enough to just play a 4-4, even if I'm not getting the ring tempt stuff going on. Well, let's Mortar Muster first, see what we find. Alright, we'll just play another green source. I think I am going to play a 4-4. Ooh, Golem's Bite. That is very nice. Now I can Golem's Bite their Flyer and Haunt of the Dead Marshes, and then I can uh, have the Ring tempt me next turn and be at level 4 on the Pathfinder. Which is very cute. Probably more cute than anything, but I'm still going to do it. Scry another land to the bottom. Find a combat trick. You know what, I'm going to put the Ring Bearer onto this 1-1 one, one now, so I could actually use my Mana Dork as a Mana Dork if I want to. Mirror of Galadriel is a lot of mana, and I'm already, like, scrying and drawing, discarding all the way through my deck, so I think we're good on the Mirror of Galadriel. Protector of Gondor, that does give them a 1-1 one, one chump blocker, which can trade into the ring bearer. But we have the combat trick, so we're good. I also have the 7 mana ability if I draw land, and I did draw land, so now I don't even have to spend a spell to get the ring bearer in. I still think I probably should, so I can play more creatures this turn as well. Yeah, 
Yeah, because I kind of need to have stuff on blocks here. And if I tap out to give that plus three, plus three, then I have a single two, two on blocks against multiple three power creatures. A little sketchy. Golem, patient plotter. Great way to have the ring tempt you. A three, one. When it leaves the battlefield for any reason, the ring tempts you, and you could even sack creatures to bring Golem back. Quick Beam is phenomenal. So... Just Quick Beam it up here. And get aggro with it. I'm going to keep Lash of the Balrog. Be super safe. If they draw into any really good creatures that could swap the game around, we can blow one up. But currently we are now very far in the lead off all this nonsense we've managed to do here, which is great. Gothmog does give them another 1-1 one -one to block our ring bearer. Right, let's eat our food. Another land. I can tap out to lash the Balrog, but I think I just use Pathfinder's ability to trample for lethal somewhere here. Yeah, I think I just attack all and then I just trample for lethal. Plus three, plus three, trample. Yeah, we just... Give the ring bearer plus three plus three trample, then we trample over for three. And the ring bearer ability makes our opponent lose another three life. I mean, there's multiple places we could trample for the lethal here, but. We'll do it. The ring bearer. And there we go. That's going to be another victory for us. We are now 5-1, and one, a very, very good run off of this sealed deck. We are one win away from breaking even. Well, this is kind of an awkward hand. It's got a great late game, a solid early game, and a bunch of lands and a mirror. I'm going to keep it here. Just need to draw some mid-range cards for the middle, and hopefully not too many more lands. Mordor Muster definitely helps us. A lot here, giving us another draw step to try to find a mid-range card. And we do find our Pathfinder. There's a Peregrine Took on turn three as the first play for our opponent. We'll drop down our Mana Dork now and pass the turn. Could play a five mana card next turn, but I think I'd rather play the Morgul Lieutenant, then play the Quick Beam, then play the Horn. That way we get two triggers off of Quick Beam potentially, which would be absolutely deadly if we can do that. Oh, speaking of absolutely deadly, there's some kind of wild mythic rare going on here. It's indestructible. Okay. Yeah, that is pretty incredible. So an indestructible 2-2 period. They can remove the indestructible counter to give another one of their creatures indestructible till end of turn. Put a plus one plus one counter and lifelink counter onto that creature and Arwen. That is a really, really, really good card. So it's going to be a 3-3 lifelinker. Their other creature is going to be indestructible lifelink to end of turn. All right. Um, I guess I play Gothmog and hold up the ambush. Not that the ambush is going to do anything if they have the one mana up for their incredible onboard combat trick. I can still trample over an indestructible creature. So we're still golden for the... Quick beam next turn into the enraged tree folk the turn after that. Alright, there's their mana dork. And a West Fold Rider. So Mirror of Galadriel looking horrible this game. They don't have the mana up for their indestructible here, so we probably do just go for it with a big trample swing. They have to actually go for some trades on block or just take a bunch of damage. The problem is that they can lifelink swing back very hard if they remove the counter from Arwen. Have two lifelinkers coming in. 
Death Touch Trample is super sweet on this Orc army, by the way. So I doubt they're blocking that at all. Okay, so they're going to trade off into the... Uh, the Gothmog, because they have the indestructible Arwen, so the Arwen doesn't uh, doesn't die in that combat, but the 3-1 does trade off. Landrovel, they give a creature flying every time they attack with two or more creatures. Alright, we play our next tree folk here. Holding up our combat trick. And I, our combat trick gives Death Touch, so we could have, like, Death Touch Trample out of nowhere. Which does do one damage to even an indestructible creature. Does one to that and tramples the rest over. If we draw into one of our uh, Graveyard Recursion spells, that Sam's thingamabob, that'll be really good. I could even make the Pathfinder the Ring Bearer, so that they have to trade Pathfinder for Pathfinder. Well, no, because then they can... Block, remove the counter, get a plus one plus one counter and lifelink onto both of these, and then the Pathfinder beats ours and gains them too. So I don't even think... I don't think it matters too much what I put the Ring Bearer on. I'm just going to put it on the Pathfinder and then not attack with it, I think. So they're going to use the trick, make the flyer a 4-5 lifelink. They're going to try to block the 4-4 four, four here, and then we do death touch trample. We kill the 4-5 and trample over 4 damage. Feels good. Oh, it's indestructible till end of turn. Well, we trample over and we don't lose the army, which is still very good. But that does permanently have lifelink, which is so bad. Golem's Bite doesn't actually kill most of these cards. They have seven lifelinking power on board. Arwen is just incredible. No quick beam, but still pretty busted. Yeah, I have no idea how we even outrace unless I draw into another tree folk or something. Because they're going to just gain seven. Just attack with those two, gain seven in the sky. They go to 14 with two blockers up minimum. That's if they play nothing else. I don't think Golem's Bite really does much here. I mean, I guess it works. I don't know. I'll keep it. It works as a combat trick, too, because we can make their creature smaller with Trample and get more damage in. Doors of Durin. When they attack, they get more creatures out, don't they? Yep. And that triggers every time they attack, so they're going to trigger every turn. Scry to reveal the top, get a creature. Scry to reveal the top, get a creature. It does come out tapped and attacking, so it doesn't get to be on blocks, but... I think they already just went off Landroval, Arwen, life gain. Maybe Golem's Bite can get us there. Maybe clearing out the Pathfinder so they only have two, they only have one blocker up can get lethal. I don't think so though, because they can block Quick Beam with Peregrine and take four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight is nowhere near 14. Both to the bottom. So they're drawing blind off the doors of Durin. It is a land. It's a great hall, the Citadel. So, no creature for free. So, Golems bite the Pathfinder, force them into a chump block. This is the play. I have two Legends on board, so it's three mana to use this Mirror of Galadriel. So I can use the Mirror and do the Golems bite, so I suppose that's what we're doing. They hit a creature off off the top with the doors. We're just gonna die. Tapped and attacking doesn't get trample unless they control a dwarf. 
And they don't have a dwarf. So I probably have one chump blocker. 9, 10, 11, 12. Yeah. Kill the 2 2 is the choice. Sure. They're down to four. I just don't think we can beat Narwin. This card is a stupid magic card. If we found some removal for their lifelinkers... Oh, that's just dead, isn't it? Seven, eight, nine... No. I mean, we could be dead, depending on what they hit off the doors. Scry both to the bottom. Draw blind. Find many partings. Okay. Chump go to one. They gain nine life here, though. They're going to be at 13. There's like no way I crack back for lethal. But we got to try. Scry one, draw one. Nasty end. Not going to do it. Forest is also not going to do it. Alright, thanks for working upkeep stop. Uh, I was thinking maybe we haunt the dead marshes in the upkeep, but... I guess we don't. So we mirror of Galadriel here. Celeborn's not going to do it. Doesn't block it all in the sky. Nope. Just get dumpstered by Arwen. We are 5 and 2 as we head into game 8. Alright, here we are for game 8. This has a really nice start. I like all of our 2 mana cards. Obviously we need to roll out one of the creatures first before we play the fall. But we can kind of do whatever order we want. I guess if I start with Pathfinder, then turn three, I get to play both the March and the Fall, which is really good. If they don't removal spell our Pathfinder, so I'll go for it. Opponent is on the play and has turn two Mauher Urukai Captain. So really, really aggressive start from our opponent because any of their amass is going to come with an additional plus one plus one counter. So any of the multitude of three mana amass cards will be super devastating here. Definitely starting. Starting from the back foot this game. Luckily, they didn't have a three mana mass card. They just have the Easterling Vanguard for two. So, not horrible. Let's drop the gate and the fall here. Get our scry. Like both of these. Golem's Bite immediately kills the Urukai Captain without having to sack anything. So, I think we're going to go like. Rangers land uh, Golem's Bite next turn. And I could just be on all removal. I think that's fine. Lash of the Balrog might be a little redundant. I think it's still an okay draw, though. No, I'll get, I'll get rid of it. It's our third removal spell here. We only have one more creature to cast, so I do want some more creatures. Plus level three of the fall could even work as a removal spell. So we're just going to take two menace damage. And they're going to pass the turn with all their mana up. That makes me a little concerned. Are they going to blow up our army in response to this then? Alright, you got it. I would much rather they blow up the army than the mana dork here. So, fair enough. Drop the rangers... Drop our land to have the ring tempt us. Got enough mana to cast the only spell we have left next turn without the mana dork. So I'm going to make the mana dork the ring bearer. And then I'm ready to golems bite their captain. Which I'll do in response to them trying to amass an army or just in response to them attacking if they just send in. I don't know. Probably... Again, it could be better to do that during our turn because 
They could have something that's like sack a creature draw to. We've seen that a lot. I'm just going to tap out for the Lash of the Balrog. All right, then we don't have to worry about interaction for our Golem's Bite. Cool. Kill the captain. Could fight and draw two here. I guess I don't need the Mana Dork anymore with two more lands, so that seems reasonable. Yeah, I don't have to fight here, but I think I'm I'm happy to. That's fine. I'm gonna find some more gas. Kelborn the Wise certainly counts. That is a big snowbally attacker. Just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger the more it attacks. There's a Swarming of Moria, make their Orc army bigger. It's a 3-3 now against our 3-3, so we don't have good blocks for that. Next turn we have the mana to play the Vanguard and hold up our Bitter Downfall, which is excellent. Interesting, they might be trying to combat trick us here. I guess I'll just Downfall in response if they do, let's see. So attacks is a 4-4. Into their 3-3. All right, just get in there. Seems good to me. Drop the Vanguard and pass the turn. I thought this thing, oh, I thought it was plus and plus encounters. I thought that card was a lot better. My bad. Oh, do I need to downfall here? I probably should. Kills me in four attacks at its current size. They have the indestructible trick for it. Ooh, sack it and draw two. Very good. Banish our Celeborn off the splash from the treasure token. Seems good. Well, as much as I'd love to draw a card, discard a card starting now, I should probably get my Snarling Warg out. I'm going to hold on to his land, though, so whatever I make the ring bearer, uh, I've got a way to discard something to draw into something good. War Beast of Gorgroth. That is a big blocker, which means Golem's Bite is going to give unblockability to either of my creatures, but they'll crack back for five if I send in with both. I hit for five, then they hit for five, then I hit for five. I th that's probably fine. Ooh, Bowmasters is beautiful. I don't think I chump here. I think I take five. Go to seven. And then try to potentially lethal them on the crackback. Because our warg is going to get bigger. Our army is going to be a big attacker. Shoot them in the face, they're at 8 life, take 4 guaranteed. Lock the vanguard with vanguard, I guess. I guess we don't lethal them. I kill vanguard, then they still just block the vanguard with the army. Probably best to pop the vanguard, though. We would just hold our own vanguard on blocks. Onto the dead marshes? Well, now we have an even better blocker. So we'd be fine with the trade. I'm gonna get rid of the Mirror of Gladiol. I actually think that's just played out to be like the worst gardener deck. It was the last edition, so this is what it is. Ooh, that's a great draw. Four, five tree folk. The ring tempts us again. We've gotten a lot of really good value throughout this whole sealed event. Just by having the ring tempt us a couple times each game, make sure we could have that to discard a card, draw a card every turn. Or draw a card, discard a card the other way around. It looks like we're pretty locked in here. Unless they draw into something pretty incredible. 
I think we've got the lead by a lot. All right, and they're going to scoop them up. We are now six and two. Guaranteed to be having a really nice run out of this deck. I did not think this deck was going to be in contention for a seven win run with just the quality of the sealed pool, but the deck has played out really, really nicely. And we are going to be competing for potential seven win run. The final boss next round, win or lose, final game of magic for today. We'll see how it all pans out for us. So we head into the final boss. Here we are for the final boss, the final game of magic for today, win or lose. We've got that same early start here with the Woe's Pathfinder into playing both the March from the Black Gate and the Fall of Gilgalad on turn three. So we'll get started the same way here and pass the turn. Our opponent is on black and red. Drop our march from the black gate. Drop our fall of Gilgalad. Could play our big tree folk next turn, which is quite nice. Doing really good on land, so if we get any more, we'll dump them to the bottom. And we did find two more, so we're going to dump those away. Our opponent has no removal for our cheap dorks, which is exceptional for us. Getting started rolling things out nice and quickly on the play here. And there's a Quarrel's End for our opponent. Discard a card, draw two, get a 1-1 one, one onto the board. And we're just going to load up this army. Make it a absolutely massive, absolutely terrifying threat. Roll out our 4-5 Trample as well. Put the Ring Bearer on the Pathfinder again because the Ring Bearer ability really doesn't matter on any bigger creatures until we're also drawing and discarding a card when they attack. So I can just move the Ring Bearer over when the Ring tempts me again next time. For now, we should just put it on our smallest creature to be able to get past bigger blockers. We could still put it on the Orc army if I'm like 100% convinced I won't be attacking with Pathfinder in the future. Oh, they're over it. They just hated that curve. It was a really good curve. Uh, but what I was saying is we can still put it on the Orc army just in case, because sometimes players do have just massive creatures in this format, so even a 4-4 four, four, or 5-5 five, five ring bearer can get in. Like, I've had like a 5 power ring bearer against an Oogluk that was like a 12-12 or something like that, so that's kind of cool, but... Um, but yeah, I think it's fine to put it on Pathfinder, because if I don't draw another land here, I only have the mana to play one of these anyway, so I might try to get like a, an attack in with Pathfinder. I guess not through the 1-1. One, one. Either way, incredible sealed run today. We are going to pull out the seven win run by the skin of our teeth. Definitely had a few misplays for sure in a few of those rounds, getting us closer to some losses, but just kept things interesting. Still got us the seven win run, still got us the maximum number of awards, uh, still got us the maximum number of rewards. I'm still uh, really, really happy with this deck overall, though. It was a very, very big overperformer. For the most part, the one card that I would say for big over and underperformers is Mirror of Galadriel. That was a massive underperformer. We drew it at a really, really bad time where almost any other card in our deck would have helped us get lethal or at least uh, block the opposing big creature without being forced to chump block. Uh, and we just hit Mirror of Galadriel, which just did nothing at that point, so... Really bad in that game, and in a few of the other games, we also were just not finding the time to have the extra mana to toy around with the mirror, so did not like that card a lot, but it was the last addition to the deck. I think pretty much everything else played fine. I don't think we ever cast Nasty End, so that's probably the second underperformer, but everything else, we got to play it, I think, at least once, and they all played quite well. Uh, Celeborn the Wise was a little bit of an underperformer because I didn't realize he doesn't actually get plus and plus one counters, he just gets plus and plus one till end of turn. It was still fine, but 
Uh, I still want to run it for sure, because it's not like we had better creatures to run over Celeborn. But I think I probably should have cut the Mirror of Galadriel and played like a... Maybe a Gala Dream Guide or a Chance Met Elves or something. Some kind of other filler creature instead of this mirror would have played better most of the games that we drew it in. Outside of that, though, pretty happy with the deck build. Everything panned out super well for us. And we used every single black card in the sealed pool. That is hilarious. They were all great cards. So it is what it is. You play what you got. That is going to end today's event, though, and that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons very much for supporting the channel as well as you for watching. If you're interested in seeing more videos like this, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you more in your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. Other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.